you mention those two, it's nothing but laughter and laughter. And I can guarantee you, if laughter is the best medicine, every one of you will leave tonight feeling a little bit better. And I'm going to turn this evening over to Patricia and our wonderful guest of honor. I just have to give you more. <laughs> Before we start, I would like to tell that story about Dick McCracken. <laughs> Dick, there Dick are a few chairs over here if anybody wishes to Dick was a great friend of mine who passed away a number of years ago, and every year he would hold a yard sale. <laughs> and uh, this year, one year he sold a birdhouse to my wife, and after paying Dick for it, I think $4, she realized there was no hole in it. <laughs> so she took it back to Dick, and he took a look at it, and he said uh, he wasn't about to give that $4 back. He said, uh, Barbara, that uh, birdhouse is for a woodpecker. <laughs> Dick was also pretty quick. <laughs> Before I start, I, I notice a few fellows in the crowd that might have the tendency to speak out. <laughs> so I would just like to ask them that, um, to hold it, and I'll meet them upstairs, <laughs> and they'll buy the drinks, and I'll take them on one, one at a time. <laughs> I don't think you need me here, Dad. <laughs> okay, let's get started by um, having you tell us a bit about your ancestry, starting with your dad's side. My dad's uh, father was uh, Robert Heffernan, and his mother was Selena Powers. Uh, my dad uh, had three brothers and three sisters. Um, about your mother's side? Oh, my mother's side. <laughs> On my mother's side, um, she was the daughter of Michael Mac McKeever and of Margaret Kelly. And I'd like to speak a bit about Margaret Kelly. Margaret Kelly left Ireland, went to relatives, in, uh, to Kelly relatives in the United States, left there and came up to Duro, Ontario, because she had a sick cousin by the name of Ellen Clark. After Ellen Clark died, she married Mac McKeever, my grandfather. And they had how many children? They had six children, four boys and two girls, which my mother, Ellen McKeever, was one of. And your parents also had six children. That's right. <laughs> Donnie, to start with, uh, deceased, and Della, deceased, and um, myself, Margaret, Wink, Chris, Mick, Mike. <laughs> and you and Mom also had six children. Could you mention your favorite first? <laughs> I'll, uh, I'll, I'll sidestep that one. Yes, I have six six children, five. I'm going to say five boys, but I think I have five girls and one boy. And he, he can talk about that, but another night. Oh. I have ten grandchildren, which I think there's four here tonight. Tommy is 13, started to high school this year, and uh, <laughs> and of course his name is Tom too. Anna's 12. Danny, seven, and Andrew, eight. So tell us about your first impression of Lakefield. I'm just going to try to speak out, and I'll leave that with you if I'm not allowed oh, enough. Sure, okay, yeah, just try. that's fine. Um, my first impression of Lakefield was coming in the, what was then called the North Road, Queen Street. And just about um, Braden Manor, 
when you when I came around the turn, I could see from there to the Anglican Church. I was seven, but I remember it like it was yesterday. What a beautiful sight. Try it sometimes. I know it's changed. But you can see the trees and the houses on both sides. And at seven years of age, that left a real impression with me, and it's never left. I, this town is a great town. Tell us a bit about the neighborhood you moved into and the people there. Well, we moved on to, to Bishop Street, and uh, I'll give you some of the names. A lot of you will know them. I'll start up at the top of the hill. There was the Deladons, uh, Wassons, Paytons. And on the side of the hill, we lived on the side of the hill. Then you go to the corner, there was Wingetts, Spencers, Welburns, and over to Larry Neal's. What did you do for entertainment? <laughs> yeah, I've got to think here for a minute. Well, we spent an awful lot of time at Wingetts. Uh, Cease and Ruby Wingett were just wonderful people, and it was an open door policy. And uh, Neil Watson will probably vouch for this that we had our own chair. <laughs> chairs out around the walls, and you just went to Wingetts whenever you felt like it. In fact, if you didn't show up, somebody was asking where you were. Were you upset about something? But uh, other than that, uh, I think we had what we thought was a small Olympic village. We had uh, the rink, the outdoor rink behind Wingetts that we flooded every year. Between Wingetts and our place, we had a, a big field we played football on. Across the road on the research property, we had a ball diamond. And then we used the uh, the hill, the road, to uh, with our bobsleds. In those days, um, cars were usually put up on uh, we, up on blocks during the winter because uh, you know there was no antifreeze, so most people walked. Um, and then we had what we call the grass hill to ski on. So we thought we were we were pretty fortunate. Is that hill you're talking about where you built the fort? I heard about. Yes, Ken Wingett and I, I don't know whether Ken's here tonight or not, so he won't be able to take me up on this. <laughs> but uh, Ken Wingett and I built a fort up on the Grass Hill. It was a two-story fort. We called it a fort. Uh, maybe you could call it a shack. And it had a tower up on the top. We even put a small tower up. And Ken and I would sit up there on a plank. And at night, we'd look down on the lights of Lakefield. <laughs> and discuss our future. <laughs> Um, and then, well, that was, that was about all, I guess. <laughs> Is that where the two of you started a grass fire? Yeah. <laughs> I'll get that over with. We went up one Sunday afternoon to take care of our property and cut the grass. <laughs> We decided the cricket way to cut the grass was to start a little fire. The fire uh, got out of hand uh, quite quickly. Actually, I will be honest. Ken wanted to put it out, and I thought, oh, let it go a bit. And uh, anyway, uh, we decided we'd had enough. We couldn't handle it. Ran down over the hill, down past... Uh, my place and I knew my mother would be in the kitchen. She was always there and as we ran by we yelled call the fire brigade <laughs> And uh, we went to the haystack. We used to keep some cows right in the village. You can't do that today So we hid in the haystack and Bill Hammond was the Fire chief then and afterwards. I think Bill had an idea it was us <laughs> he, You could see him drive slowly over the hill and, and take a good look at the haystack. <laughs> did you and Ken not do some boat building as well? We did build a boat. <laughs> Neil Wasson would come along and help us with that. And I think it was Chris and Wing Wasson half. And uh, I uh, didn't, uh, I had a lot of faith in that boat. We tired all the, all the joints. Neil and uh, Ken didn't have as much faith. They wore swimming suits, but I, I, was, I was in full attire. And I, uh, we jumped on it, and uh, it was, we went out to the middle of the Autonomy River, and it immediately sank, and it was still there. <laughs> Tell us 
about the time you were quarantined. <laughs> yes, we had scarlet fever, and and uh, we were uh, we were quarantined. You would be quarantined then with a placard on the door. You you couldn't come out. You couldn't go out, and nobody could come in. But I remember uh, Bill Ackerson and his wife Alice. They would leave provisions at the front door. And we were quarantined for six weeks, which is a long time. So after five weeks, we had quite a storm, and the field flooded um, because of the, the mild weather and froze. So all <laughs> these young people were skating, and we decided to throw caution to the wind. And we donned the skates, and we headed for the pond, and everybody else left. <laughs> about uh, what was going on at the old Canada cement buildings at that time. Well, at that time, uh, most people will probably know this, on the water side of the cement works, uh, there's major tanks. And the government uh, decided to store wheat. I don't know whether it was excess wheat or... But I guess it was mostly because of the railroad tracks. This was... Uh, they could uh, bring it in by, by rail. And... Uh, I believe it took two years, if I remember rightly, to fill those tanks. So it, they employed about 50 men. On our side, on, at Bishop Street, the American Nephilene installed uh, three mills. And uh, Frank Coyle's trucks would draw the rock from the head of Stony Lake, where the mine is now, and they would crush the stone uh, there. My dad was one of the men that worked there. Okay. Tell us about the lesson that you learned there. Well, I went to visit my dad one day, and I, uh, I uh, went in through the door, and they were having a break. And the, the weights for these mills, they would put, you know, they would write on this blackboard. I'm, I'm going to tell you my age then, and maybe that'll be an excuse for what I did. <laughs> I think I was 12 or 13, Tommy. <laughs> and uh, I rubbed off all the figures. <laughs> so none of the men said a word. They just, uh, when they were through, they walked out through the door. And, and my dad was the last one to come. I think this was on purpose. And he said, uh, you rubbed off those figures. I said, yeah, yes, I did. He said, I tell you what, you put them back on. Uh, you know, much chance I had of putting on this bit. <laughs> so two hours later, uh, he finally came over to me, and he didn't have to say anything. He said, you can go home now. <laughs> it was the best lesson I ever learned to, to leave what didn't belong to you to someone else. <laughs> what kind of chores were expected of you as a, as a young boy or teenager? When we moved to Lakefield, the, the water supply was bad. All the houses had little pumps on the you know, on the cupboards, but the wells were bad. So my dad, he, he was quite a fellow. He uh, started along the bottom of the hill over in the cement works and he, he was looking for water. Finally, he saw water coming out of the hill and he uh, dug all around, uh, put gravel in, boxed it all in, and after that, the whole neighborhood used that water. They'd have to carry it, but at least they had good fresh water. I have a feeling that spring is still there. And, uh, of course, my job was to carry water. <laughs> what about Saturday chores? Saturday morning, uh, we used to keep a couple of cows in, in the village, and uh, I would, uh, <coughs> on my little wagon, I would fill up the cream can with milk, and I would take it to the block road where Maggie Sullivan lived, and she had a separator and a churn and we'd separate the milk. It was always a very enjoyable day for me. She was a great lady. And uh, then she would churn, you know, use the churn to make butter. And I'd probably come home with three pounds of butter. And your dad had a ranch? Tell us about that. Yeah, my, my dad had a ranch down on uh, 134. And uh, sometimes if the weather was bad, we would have to walk down there. I suppose it was three miles. And I recall a little bit of a story. Ken Winget and I, uh, were, uh, I was asked to go down, and Ken said he'd go with me. So we'd water the cattle and feed them. And we decided to take our hockey equipment with us, and Ken was a goaltender, so he was lugging pads. And uh, we made a big mistake. 
we got as far as Dench's Swamp, where the um, ice, uh, where the ice had frozen over. And uh, we decided that we'd play hockey first rather than go and feed the cattle first. And that was a big mistake. Because after we were through playing hockey and we looked at that long road, by the time we got back to Lakefield, uh, we were both exhausted. Your dad kept horses in a barn behind your house uh, in the winter, I think you yeah. said. Tell us about that and the blind mare you had. Yes. I used to take them, uh, ride one, and lead one to the to the Autonomy River where I would we would water them, and I tie one up to uh, the tree while I watered the other one, and I tied the other mare to the tree, and I was watering the blind mare, and uh, I don't know what happened, but I I think she thought maybe that the other mare was on the other side of the river, so she started to walk out on the ice, and I've tried to hold her as far as you know as much as I could. But she finally reached uh, the open water. She swam across, got up on the other side, saw her mistake, turned around, and uh, jumped back in, but she didn't make it back. So uh, I cannot, I often think about it, but I had to be upset because I could not remember bringing the other horse home. Tell us what you remember about church when you were a boy. Well, we were on the altar, three or four fellows, and Bob Deladon, a lot of people know Bob in this part. Bob was late, so the rest was decided that, you know, that they had all the cupboards along the wall and all for the vestments, and we decided to get in those cupboards, and when Bob came in, come in, we scared him. <laughs> so I think there was a trickster in the crowd, and uh, it wasn't Bob that came through the door, it was the priest. <laughs> And uh, somebody said, now. <laughs> so we jumped out, rasped him to the floor. <laughs> but he was a good-natured man. <laughs> he saw the funny side of it. <laughs> so would you have to walk all the way to church every week? Um, no, I, I didn't. Not a lot. If I got up early enough, I would uh, go down to Wingett's and... Cease and Ruby would be heading for the Baptist Church, and we were very ecumenical. I would ride in the back seat, and they would drop me off and pick me up after Mass. And the school you attended, it's no longer there, is it? No, the, school, the public school that I attended is now across the road, and the, uh, the high school, of course, is on Bridge Street. Yes. Tell us about one of the highlights of school for you. Well, one of the highlights, of course, was going to the, uh, the rink on Colburn Street, the old rink. And uh, I would say that there could be anywhere from 20 to 25 people standing outside. If you got going at night, you didn't get any money because they, there wasn't no money. And uh, so we'd stand around there. And uh, I remember there's a couple of stories. And as I see Neil Watson here, I'm going to tell this one. <laughs> Clifford Dunford was older then, and Neil would be younger. Uh, finally, Clifford took Neil's hand, and uh, Dave Charlton, he was looking after the rink, and he was quite a good-natured fellow. And he went up to the wicket. He said, Mr. Charlton, do you charge admission here? He said, yes, we do. He said, well, charge mine and the last. We're going in. <laughs> Dave got quite a laugh out of it, and he, he let them go home. <laughs> Neil told me that story. Uh, around that time, Keith Montgomery was playing junior hockey. And in the old Lakefield Arena, and a lot of people here will remember, there was a, a dressing room that was a, a two-story. There was a dressing room upstairs and a bit of a snack bar. So Keith, he had his own private uh, box up there and uh, they kept a rope in it. And so uh, he would open the window and drop the rope down and one by one he'd haul us up the edge of the ring. <laughs> and he'd always be in a hurry because he was supposed to be on the ice playing hockey. They understand you started playing hockey in grade seven. Yes, I may not have some of the facts right. That's why I've asked these guys to to hold off here. <laughs> um, 
Yes, we had the, the first organized hockey in Lakefield was the o OMHA, and it was uh, organized uh, by Ken Jenkins, our scoutmaster. Jack Millage was our, our coach, uh, and our principal, uh, Mr. Everett Sloan, was a uh, coach. And they were uh, a great group. And uh, we went to the finals that year, and I believe the rink was always full. And Elmira beat us out. Who were two of your most faithful fans at that time? Uh, Reverend Kelly and uh, Dr. Masters and our priest. They would always have had a spot at the ring, and they'd always be standing there. And you might even hear the odd swear word come from those two guys. <laughs> <laughs> if you weren't playing up to par, they didn't hesitate. <laughs> the game were very ecumenical at the ring. <laughs> Okay, we'll talk a little more about hockey later on, but tell us now about some of the jobs you held as a young person. Um, I worked for BQ Dinch for a couple of years, uh, pitching hay. I handed that over to Ken Wingett. I, I went on to Joe Parbury's Ice House. Following that, I went to the Lakefield Boats, and the, most everybody came up through the Lakefield Boats, because if you didn't come up through there, then you really were not considered Lakefield. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and years later, the Lakefield uh, boat, uh, boats burnt down. This would have been uh, around the, the late 1940s. How much money would you have made then as a teenager? Anywhere from 10 to $18, but it went a lot further than a uh, week then, you know, that money goes today. Don't I remember a story about you getting blood poisoning at one of those jobs? Yes, I can't remember the job, but uh, I remember after a couple of weeks of having a very sore foot and a, a red streak up my leg, and I pretty well figured it was blood poison. So I went over to Dr. Gassel and uh, when I rushed in, he rushed out. He yelled, <laughs> he yelled at me, you'll have to stay here and look after the children. i got to go to the hospital. <laughs> so I put up with it for a while longer. <laughs> and uh, Mrs. Gassel finally came home. He came back. He immediately drove me back into the hospital. I stayed there for a week and took penicillin. And he actually came in, picked me up, and brought me home. <laughs> Let's go back to hockey right now for a little while. Tell us a little more about hockey after Bantam. Well, after Bantam, we uh, played midget, juvenile, um, junior B. Some of the fellas that are here tonight, we played junior B in Peterborough. Uh, we went on to play some senior B uh, with the senior, uh, senior B Pete's and the McGillis Eagles. And uh, after that, I went to Oshawa and played for a time there. Okay. You often mention a lot of the great players you've had the privilege of playing with. Yes, I writ and I wrote them down. <laughs> <laughs> My memory's good, but short. <laughs> yeah, I think the greatest team that we ever had was right here in Lakefield, the Intermediate A's. We won the Lake Shore, and, and uh, we just had the greatest bunch of fellows, and I'm just going to read their names. Some of them are here tonight. Mm -hmm. Joe Blewett, Keith Montgomery, Dick McCracken, Gordon Coyle, Bill Twist, um, Watson Brothers, um, Paul Doris, and the Floyd Brothers. Tom Birch, Joe Sabatina. I got the last <laughs> With my eyes. Uh, my own brothers, Eddie Rowe, and the list goes on. Who was your manager at the time that you played Intermediate A? Uh, Mr. Garnet Samus. <laughs> yes, uh, Garnet was the, the police chief in Lakefield, and Garnet Samus was one of the finest men I ever met. He uh, also knew as a police chief that sports were very necessary. And he, he worked very hard with almost every team that, that he could help. And I think, of course, in his mind, was, it was the best way to keep boys off the street and give them a start. <coughs> Did the Lakefield Junior C's challenge your intermediate team in the 70s? Yes, they did. 
And one of the boy's fathers, Jim Crawford, told me one day that uh, his son, he, was, he played Junior C then, and uh, we'd hung up our skates, but uh, I believe it was for a good reason. It was for some charity, so the boys said they'd play the game. So Jim's son told him that they were going to play us, and uh, he said, we'll lick those old fellas, Dad. And uh, Jim said, I tell you what, he said, let's talk after the game. So we beat them 9-3. <laughs> and uh, I passed Jim on the street the next day, and he just gave me a little bit of a wink. <laughs> we're pretty happy with that. I'm sure you have some more hockey stories you would like to share. Can you tell us about the night you played in Coburg and had to go by the Porthole Hospital? <laughs> yes. Uh, we played in Coburg, and I can't remember who got hurt, but um, we, we, we all, a couple of cars went and followed to the Port Hope Hospital. When we got there, there was a nurse that seemed to know we were from Lakefield. And she said, we have a man here that I think you fellas might know. And the, some of the fellows knew him well. I didn't know him very well. But he was a very respected man. He taught, uh, he was a principal of Lakefield High School. And his name was John Harvey. And she said, Mr. Harvey is dying. So one by one, I have trouble with this. One by one, we went in and uh, shook his hand. And one by one, he called everybody by name. And I went to the bottom of the bed, and I watched these guys shake his hand in silence. And uh, I felt that uh, John Harvey was a job well done. We left in silence. We drove home in silence. And what about one of those nights you played Bowmanville in Bowmanville? Well, I, rem I remember this very well. I don't think he's in the crowd, so I can tell this story. <laughs> uh, <laughs> there was a big fellow in Bowmanville. Wouldn't, he had reached the point where he wouldn't even listen to the referee. So we had a, a big defenseman, and I must say I was proud to, say, to play beside him. He was a superstar. Keith Montgomery lives here in Lakefield. And, uh, Keith decided that uh, he'd had enough too, and this guy should have been listening when he was talking. So Keith didn't say anything, he just went over and gently picked him up and set him up in the, up in the crowd. <laughs> uh, you and Bill Stewart played Junior A hockey and boarded in Oshawa. What was that like? Well, that, that was new. We stayed in a... Uh, uh, most of the fellows were farmed out to houses, and we, uh, there was four of us stayed in and upstairs, uh, you know, in the, in the upstairs. And um, we had a, one young fellow there, was Tim Horton's brother, Joey Horton, quite a nice young fellow. I'm not going to get in the, Another man we uh, I had a, a lot of respect for was Milt Smith. He was probably one of the greatest centermen that ever played hockey. And he was coaching there. So I got to meet some really, really nice people. But there was a guy there also, it was in the time of Patty Page, and uh, he played that record. Uh, what's that record? How much is that doggy in the wind? He played it night and day. So one morning, the fellow that I roomed with, we woke up and we said, listen, the music had stopped. But one of his buddies had gone, opened the window, and threw the record player <laughs> out into the snow. <laughs> Bringing things back to the village now, tell us what the main street was like when you were all teenagers in the late 1940s, starting with the grocery stores. How many were there? There were four grocery stores. Um, Spence and Sons, my brother-in-law worked with Spence and Sons. T.C. Young's, uh, Judson Hall, and Warren Payne's. And I believe in Elaine Wasson worked at at uh, Warren Paynes, and uh, Jero, um, Dave Miller uh, ran the barber shop and soon to be taken over by uh, Joe Ferrari. And Blake? I would, yeah, I wanted to hold oh. that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, I did want only four, but there were five. <laughs> uh, I'm just going to say this next. <laughs> I don't mind, Neil. This keeps me on my toes. Uh, I just wanted to say to Gord that I understand 
you're coming here next month, so I wasn't going to mention anything about your well, business. <laughs> I'm, sure, I'm sure you people will enjoy Gord and Donna. Judson Hall was the owner of Porter's Grocery Store, and you had some interesting times there, didn't you? <laughs> yes. Uh, 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 at Judson, and he was better known as Mucker. Mucker Hall, um, there'd always be a hot stove league there. And when you knew the, uh, the only way you knew that the hot stove league was in session, uh, especially at night, uh, you'd see one bulb burning in the store and the blinds would be pulled. You knew by that that the back door was open. And that is where you came in. But anyway, I did have some inter interesting times there. There was a pot-bellied wood stove in the middle of Muckert's store, and around that would be four or five chairs. And some of the people that would come there to see Mucker was uh, Dr. Alec Fraser, Dr. Masterson, our priest over at, uh, he would come in the back door of two, right from the church. And uh, my wife's uncles, uh, John and Victor McManus, would be there. And uh, Mr. Hilliard McCracken. And any young boys that, uh, uh, you know, wanted to come along. I uh, probably learned there to uh, listen. <laughs> uh, and uh, there was some, um, these men, if you did listen, they had an awful lot to say. Uh, and the other thing is that I think they were, they had a bit of strong solidity. <laughs> they never offered it to us. <laughs> they would give us a coke. <laughs> Where did everyone hang out with their friends in those days? <laughs> well, uh, Food Haven, or is it Food Haven across the street? i get that next time. That was Freddie Wanamaker's, known then as the Coronation Inn. And uh, between there and um, Bill Peacock's and his daughter Pearl, uh, we would go from one to the other, watch the girls, drink Coke, and socialize. <laughs> so there was a drugstore in the village at that time. Who owned that? Elwood Northey. And uh, right next was the five to a dollar store. Right next was Holland's, and at that time, Phil Holland's mother and dad ran that store. Then right next was uh, Wes Graham's uh, clothing store. Bill Twist worked there, and that's why he's always dressed better than the rest of us. <laughs> uh, and then uh, Archie Stewart, uh, he ran the uh, Quartha Hardware's house. Archie started the Quartha Hardware. And then, if you went across the corner, was Teddy Crawford's Meat Market. And uh, I believe uh, Ralph Beavis took that over. Uh, Lenny worked with Ralph Beavis, and then Lenny Winget took it over. Is that right, Lynn? Yep. <laughs> and behind that was the chick hatchery, Harry Sheerns, on Burnham. Oh. Yes, Dick McCracken worked there. <laughs> Brady B. And Hendron's Funeral Home, Ken Wingett started out there after he left BQ Dinches. And uh, Ken still works there today somewhat. Tell us where Mum was at this time. Uh, she was dipping the double scoops at uh, Frosted Food. <laughs> she played the organ at the church. I was able to keep a close eye because I knew where she was all the time. <laughs> and uh, I could also watch the rest of the girls. <laughs> uh, anyway, um, later on, uh, we were, she, she followed me around in 1956. <laughs> in 1956, we were married. <laughs> Tell us a bit about the Bell Telephone Quarters. The Bell Telephone a switchboard was where the Beach Girl is now. And uh, my sister worked there, and there are quite a few names. Uh, I just don't think I can remember them all, but I, I remember some. Barbara Sterling, uh, Betsy Hammond, who's married to Bill Foster, Hazel Moore. Alice Ackerson was the supervisor. And I don't know whether Alice, never, Alice ever knew this or not, and I think Alice is here tonight. Uh, but at night, my, when my sister worked there, and she'd probably have two girls with her, 
They insist that I come and stay. I was 14, and that was for protection. <laughs> I would go sound to sleep. I never heard anything. They may have. Wasn't it around this time in the late 1940s that TV came to Lakefield? It was Delbert Dunford, uh, right next to Leonard's Hardware. Um, he had a little radio TV shop, and at nights, when TV first came in, Delbert would uh, leave one TV there, and uh, we would, uh, it was silent then, and, uh, and snowy, so we would sit up on top of the cars and we'd watch TV. Was there anywhere to go dancing at that time? Yes, actually there was in those days. There was quite a bit of live music. Teen Town had a live band, and Gord Blake was one of the members there. He could probably tell you more about that than I. And there was the Lakefield Pavilion with um, Harold McFarland and Bobby Kensman played there. So, yes, there was, we had a lot of uh, live music. And then uh, at our church, once a month, Tommy Sullivan and uh, Barbara's uncle, Victor McManus, uh, Tommy played the violin and Victor called and we'd square dance. In 1950 you got started in the electrical trade. Tell us who you started out with. I started out with Jack Bowles. My, my, my mother mentioned to me that I should check with Jack and he, see if he needed a hand. So I dropped in there and Madeline, who I see is here tonight, said yes I think he'll hire you come back tonight. So. I, I came back and uh, that's where I started and uh, uh, Jack and I been, were, until Jack died, lifelong friends. And you later worked for other companies? Yes, I worked for um, Cam Watson and I, uh, Neil's oldest brother, worked for Donovan Electric. They were uh, from Toronto, but an American firm. We did the uh, Woolworth building. We worked in Belleville for them, and we did the Millbrook Reformatory. I also worked for Comstocks, Comstocks, and in those days, you would have to bounce from place to place. You would have to go where the work was. And uh, then I uh, ended up working for Atkinson's, and probably was some oh, Peterborough, Peterborough Electric. And it sounds as though you kept in touch with your mentor, Jack, over the years. I did. I would often call Jack if I had a problem. Jack would always be there for me. And uh, about 20 years later, he called me one night, and I knew then I had graduated. <laughs> <laughs> Wasn't it about 1958 when you decided to go into business for yourself? Yes, I really didn't decide to go into business, but uh, it was about two years after we were married, and things were slow, the economy was not good, and uh, Gordon Coyle got me to do a job for him, and I did, and it went from there. If you had to do it over again, would you go into business for yourself again? Yes, I would. It has its ups and downs, but I have enjoyed my work so much, and I've met so many people, and so many people have entrusted their work to, to us, and I thank them for that. Tell us some of the more interesting stories you have from your years in business. Well, I always like this little story. Uh, one Sunday afternoon, Marjorie Wilford called me, and as soon as I heard her voice, I knew that I should have been there to fix her oven. So I blurted out, oh yes, Mrs. Oven. <laughs> so Marjorie started to laugh, and I started to laugh. She hung up. <laughs> <laughs> For people that may not know, most people here would know that that's Derry and Rick's mother. And then there was the morning you were driving down Caroline Street. Uh, hello? <laughs> yes, I, uh, we're coming down Caroline Street. We lived up at the top of the hill. I was driving a 66 Ford. I'll never forget it. Uh, Red Ford, and uh, I realized when we just got in a boat to the Presbyterian Church that didn't have any brakes. <laughs> and uh, I had two guys with me, my nephew and Barbara's uncle, Victor McManus. I said, boys, no brakes. So uh, 
I just can hardly remember what I could see, but one thing I do remember, and the cars were going back, zip, zip, zip. <laughs> and I had it in my mind to run into the Presbyterian Church. <laughs> and a lot of things go through your mind. <laughs> Next, I thought that Montgomery had a snack bar across the road. <laughs> but somehow, I think a guy driving the Czech's truck realized I was in trouble, and he let me in. Well, we kept rolling till we got to Coil's Garage. After all, that's where we wanted to go. <laughs> and we found a spot, and we swung in there. And uh, when I got there, I realized I'd pulled the steering wheel right off the frame, trying to hold the truck back. <laughs> and I said to to Vic and young Donnie, I said, "A nice piece of driving." They didn't even answer. <laughs> Ha, ha, ha.